All right, looks like we're looks like we're on board. We're on board with a bunch of on duty guys. Is what we're on board with. Bill Gustin uh, from Miami Dade, and I'm here with uh, Captain Mike Dugan from FDNY, and uh, Sam Hiddle from Wichita, Kansas, who is on duty. Steve Robertson from Columbus, Ohio, who is on duty. Uh, who is absent is Jimmy Davis from Engine 43 in Chicago. He's at a, a fire right now in his first in still district uh, with five lines operating. And Jimmy Sunig, who's on squad seven, uh, is on a change of quarters to another squad company uh, it, it, closer to the inner city. So he, uh, he's tied up too, but I, Hey, that's the real deal. That's the fire service. And, uh, uh, if that's what's going to happen, but we're going to handle this. And it's a topic that uh, we should have dealt with earlier. And some of the discussions that we had just previous to coming on board here, uh, with Steve and captain Mike and, uh, and, and welcome Sam is, uh, about, and, and I think, uh, I think P Peter Prokeo, who is not a firefighter, but is very astute. And Peter raised a, uh, a, a good point. And uh, Peter's the man behind the curtain, kind of like the Wizard of Oz. And um, uh, Steve is passionate about the need for vertical ventilation on these finished half-story fires. And so we're going to go back to that discussion. And uh, Steve, I'm going to ask you to repeat what you said about the need for vertical ventilation and what happens when you don't have it and why this, a lot of the bias against the vertical ventilation is the fear of lightweight construction. We're not dealing with that kind of construction here. Yeah, what, what I'm talking about is your two-story Cape Cods, your two and a half story frames, that's my bread and butter in my district. I, we have a lot of those. And, and I'm just going to use a Cape Cod for an example before we get into knee walls and attics. But when we get a Cape Cod that's, that's well involved on the second floor, you're going to get to the top of the stairs and you're going to be throwing water and, and you're not going to be able to go any farther because the amount of heat that's at the top of those stairs is absolutely brutal. And it's absolutely imperative if you're actually going to make the rooms and do something with that, other than throwing water, changing angles, put water in the compartment, that the truck is able to get to the roof and get you a ventilation hole. You know, you look at the coordinated attack study, and, and one of the things that frustrates me with the United States Fire Service right now is we hit the reset button with the exterior study. That's fine. That's good information. But we didn't follow that up and have the same passion about the interior stu study that told us different things, that flowing and moving was a good thing. We didn't have the same passion with the, the coordinated attack study where we showed that, that ventilation in the fire room or above creates a tremendous lift. And when we complete the flow path having an open door, we're getting a huge influx of fresh air in the bottom in the low pressure zone. And then you add a hose string to that, it even increases even more. And survivability goes up. So tell me what's bad about vertical ventilation when you have, A, it's going to make you advance on the fire faster and safer. B, we're increasing survivability for any viable victims. And C, it's tenable to actually make the push and put the fire out. Now, the caveat to that is when they're cutting the hole, guess what? Have a charged hose line to be ready to throw water, or be throwing sure the water. Charge, and make sure that charge hose line is key, key combat key. ready, combat oh. sniper. <laughs> <laughs> You're smooth, Bill. Hey, I, I gotta give a shout out to our friends at Key. And uh, Steve, you and I have had our hands on a lot of key hose uh, as instructors, and when I was in the field. So, and you're still in the field and an instructor. And um, so I just uh, can't say enough about the key hose. And I've, every one of these uh, hangouts, we say the same thing. Take the key challenge. And the key challenge is try to kink it. Uh, it's pretty tough to kink key hose. So um, 
Sam. I, Bill, I want to I want to add one other thing. Little no, you got all the time that, you want. Go that, ahead. It's really that's really quick, and it, and it goes to kind of lead into what Sam and Captain Dugan, I think, I hope, want to talk about, and that's. I'm a single engine company here in Columbus at Engine 18. We don't have a truck. Our closest truck is probably five minutes out. For, so, so I don't have a truck right up my butt ready to do that. Company officers have to give that instruction. We've gotten so away from it. I'm very blessed here. 13 truck, a truck, and, and ladder one all do a phenomenal job getting to the roof for us. They really do a tremendous job. They're all aggressive truck companies. And they're ph phenomenal to work with. The faster I can say, engine 18 to ladder 13, I need a hole in the roof when you get here. Give them that heads up. Let them, I, these guys are professionals. They spot their truck for that anyway. But it's, they can't just parlay their ass to the roof and all of a sudden there's a hole. It takes a little bit of lead time to give that truck company of what our expectations and needs are the faster it's going to happen. And we got to leave a room, pull past the fire, leave the guy's room. It's not that hard. Pull past the fire. You're seeing three sides. You're going to get a better view. And, and if you give those guys the room, they're going to get to the roof that much faster and make it happen that much faster. Steve, can you tell us the scenario that has happened over and over again, how firefighters get burned when they penetrate into a attic with fire in the knee wall. They're either not aware of it. Uh, it's hotter than hell. They move in where they open or break a window at the top of the stairs, move to the other. And what, and what, what is the, what is the common scenario where these guys get burned? It's, it's been my experience. The biggest problem we have is, is a couple things. A, we're in too big of a hurry. When we get up there, it's probably not recognized that the fire's in the knee walls and not necessarily in the attic. I think that's the biggest thing is it's not recognized that the main body of fire is not in the compartment. It's actually in the knee walls and burning around you. You're throwing water like a madman and it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And it doesn't make sense. Well, you've committed into the attic space or into that area. And then a truck company comes behind and naturally, what do they do? They open up the wall behind you. So I see Captain Dugan shaking his head. When they open that wall behind you and it's full of fire and you're in that environment, I think we all know what's going to happen. Countless times we continue to make that mistake. And one thing I will do before I commit to an attic, I punch a hole at the top of the stairs. When I'm at the threshold at the top of the stairs of the attic, I'm going to punch a hole in the wall right there. I'm going to see if I get returned because if it's in the knee wall, you're going to get pressurized smoke coming out of that dude like a banshee and if it is now we got to really slow down now we got to slow down and look at our options most of these knee wall fires don't take a ton of water to put out they're voids it's getting water into the void is the key yeah. captain mike uh you've talked about the cockloft nozzles uh we've looked at uh we've discussed bent tip nozzles uh my department likes to use uh yeah there you go and carry it in uh, my pocket you better put that back on the rig, man. It's in my pocket. All right, all right. No, you put that bent tip on your helmet <laughs> and with a rubber band because it looked not that it's functional, but you look you look like such a stud when you do that. So, um, Captain Mike, uh, what has you been in your experience with using the uh, the bent tip and the cockloft nozzles on uh, void spaces like knee walls? If at Can all, you honestly, Bill. Yes. I think it's too long. You don't bring the bent tip to fight the fire. So you've got your regular nozzle. I agree totally with Steve. You pop a hole, and I like to pop a hole on both sides of the door so I get both views. And if I get that angry, black, rolling smoke under pressure coming out of there, I stick the nozzle in that hole. Okay, I'm going to get water in there. I'm going to get some steam conversion or whatever else in there before I put my people in there. Then I get a little bit of a knockdown. As the, the um, studies say, I get a reset. On that reset, I get a minute or two to open up. I only do, I do one side. I open up a little bit, get water in there fully so I can move it around. And then I go to the other side. I don't open both sides at once. It's not a good thing. I open one side first, get that knocked down. And then I go back to the other side. 
Yeah, Mike, one thing about the vent tip where I use it, again, I'm a single engine company, right? The big advantage to me is if I'm waiting on that hold because it's not tenable, I just spin this off and spin this on. It's not a thing. And the only advantage I think you have to this is the 360 degree rotation I could put it. And it's actually, because it's not a lot of water. It's only 50 gallons a minute, 50 PSI. But the rotation of that allows me to, to hit a lot of surface with very limited movement and little, little commitment. I agree wholeheartedly. We do not have that right now. Our bent tip is the one that we use as a water fountain on the fire trucks. It's the old brass <laughs> one. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we, so, I mean, some of the guys probably have it in their coats. Some of the good engine officers, I know engine officers who've gone out and bought things like that on their own. But right now that is an issue to our guys. As far as my knowledge, I don't think it's been issued yet, but it's a great tool. And again, it's knowing the tools that are going to do the job for you and being a single engine company and having that's your response. That's your bread and butter. You have to know how you're going to do this when you're waiting for the truck and your first in truck might be out on another run. Could be another fire. I mean, that's that Murphy's law that we see all the time. And now you're waiting more than five minutes. You're waiting eight or 10 minutes for a truck to show up. Then you got to have a plan. And that's a great plan. Sam Hiddle. Sam, are you there? I'm only seeing myself and I get tired of looking at myself. So, uh, but do you, do you have Sam on board? Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing you. Are you seeing Sam? Yeah. Yeah. I, I've got a panel set up. Oh, there you are. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Sam, uh, Milwaukee is very, in fact, I tried to get somebody from Milwaukee to be on the, uh, the show today. Uh, they have uh, rather long roof ladders with hooks on both sides. And I uh, could be wrong on this, but I, I, they will open up a bay right from the ridge all the way down to the eave so that they're venting three spaces. The, whatever ceiling there is that covers the collar tie across the, the rafters. And then the two needle, knee walls. So there's, there's three void spaces. Uh, what, what's your experience with this? And is that something you do in Wichita? Uh, it, it's not something that we do in Wichita. Uh, we're primarily a chainsaw company. Um, one of the things you're going to notice um, in Milwaukee when they do the Milwaukee cut is they stick with the rotary saws. And, and in that situation, um, we don't take rotary on the uh, pitched roofs. Uh, but in that situation, that is ideal because I can just let the weight of the saw, I can drop it in there and just let the weight of the saw come down. I've got five yeah. inches of depth and I'm going to hit those three bays. Now, where my knee walls, knee walls intersect and my collar ties, um, I am going to have to make some extra cuts. Otherwise, I'm not going to get everything to fold in the way I want it to. Um, but I should feel those things as I go over them. Um, and to piggyback on what Steve was saying earlier with this whole uh, vertical ventilation is bad. Uh, one of the things I like to say is vertical ventilation is bad because it makes the fire worse. Well, I can only make the fire worse if I'm bringing fresh air in, right? I'm creating a draft just like he talked about. I'm bringing fresh air in and that's what intensifies the fire. But if I coordinate that with the attack, then that's ideal and that's what we want. So you can't have both. Okay. I understand Jimmy Sunig is with us again from his uh, change of quarters. Uh, are you on board, uh, Jimmy? Yes, sir. How are you, sir? All right. Where are you at? Hey, he looks like you're <laughs> in the squad. <laughs> change of quarters in the squad, too. Uh, Jimmy Davis, uh, he uh, is at a fire um, and his still that they ended up having seven lines on the fire. And what, what alarm is it? It's still uh, an extra alarm. They just uh, got the fire has uh, just been struck. They got water in the fire. Fire's out. Now they're doing overhaul. Still in box? Still in box. Okay. All right. Uh, since this is the first time you've been on, Jimmy, uh, I know that in the fire service training community, you're you're well known and you're well respected. But I'm sure there's some viewers out there that don't know about you. You're not a regular on this uh, on this hangout. So. Please take a, take a little bit of time and tell us about yourself. Uh, my name is Jim Sonig. I'm a lieutenant with the Chicago Fire Department, currently assigned to Squad 7. Uh, about 30 years in the fire service and 18 years in Chicago 
and of which probably 15 to 16 in the squads uh, special operations. I teach for, I used to teach. Uh, I think, I don't know if we get we picked up or not, but uh, engine essentials for uh, the hot classes for FDIC. Been a, an active, active instructor with FDIC probably for the last 13, 14 years. Um, I was brought in by Dave McGrath, the high rise operations team. And then I kind of slowly progressed to the engine, uh, engine company operations and engine. Uh, and we met, uh, I think it was at a high rise conference uh, quite some time ago. And we have a few things in common, uh, similar backgrounds. Uh, but uh, that's for another day we can talk about that. So uh, you are a consummate student of the fire service. And um, uh, your feelings on the Chicago approach to the, uh, the knee wall. And have you had people burnt? And what type of training? How do you get the word out? Uh, is it something that is in a manual or is it passed down from veteran firefighter to newer candidate firefighters, how to keep themselves from getting burned in a, uh, in a, in a half story? To answer the question be in different parts, we have training bulletins, uh, which are like our training notes. We have it in print. If, uh, if any firefighter wants to get into books and read about uh, knee wall fires or fires in half stories, uh, we have had firefighters get burned uh, in attics or in half stories. Uh, Commissioner Hoff, our, our former one of our former commissioners, had uh, had a bad incident in an attic. Uh, he was up there without a hose line. And to tag on to what uh, Sam Hiddle said, it's a coordinated fire attack. And Steve Robertson had said the same thing. It's a coordinated fire attack. That's how Chicago Fire Department approaches fires in knee walls. For us, vertical ventilation is a, is a big must but I always envision new walls uh, kind of in the shape of a horseshoe. And I say that because uh, as Sam uh, Hiddle alluded that, you know, it's gotta be coordinated and people say no on vertical ventilation. But the issue was that if, if we don't get some relief, if companies can't get up to that attic or to that half story, they're gonna, they're, the fire's gonna grow, obviously. So we have to be coordinated. So even if we can't hit it or get an access to vertical ventilation from the roof, we can get ventilation or get extinguishment from below if uh, an initial hose line or engine company is making an attempt to the attic. So we're trying to find multiple ways to skin a cat, put the fire out, or at least give the engine that's trying to make the way up into the attic a fighting chance not to get burned up. So we sometimes hit it from below or make an attack from the main floor, uh, put truck work, and then possibly getting the engines in a second line in place to hit that fire from maybe not on the same side where the stairwell axis is, but maybe from an exterior wall, uh, pulling the ceiling and opening up the knee wall from the other side of the, of the opposite side of the building to at least make some cooling attempts with the uh, condition. So we don't have any wall. Uh, you getting a run there, Jim? No, sir. Okay. Um, point of clarification. And we should have probably started with this. What are knee walls? Knee walls are in finished half stories. In other words, a two and a half story frame, story and a half frame. There are access that originally were attics or they were built that way typically accessed by a steep, narrow stairway. And that contributes to the burn injuries because you got Steve Robertson coming down the stairway and he's not saying, excuse me, when he's on fire. So we, you've got guys coming down the stairway. Uh, you've got a bedrooms up there. You may have a bathroom up there, but because the pitch of the roof of the gable roof converges with the exterior walls, you have a diminishing space where the roof converges with the floor. Now there's two types of knee wall construction. One is uh, where you they continue the floor all the way through the knee wall. That's, those are tough because you can't pull the ceiling from below. 
you can't pull a ceiling from below. The other is where you've got a regular attic where the floor ends at the stop. Yeah, stop cursing. Uh, where the floor ends at the knee wall. And that is one of your options is you could pull the ceiling from below. So um, anyway, I just wanted to explain what a knee wall is. I mean, think about it as as high as your knee. Um, now, children have been found in those knee walls. And a lot of times they're used because they're used for storage. So um, they can be, it might not just be the structure itself, but there could be a lot of contents in there as well. So uh, Sam, what is your... Uh, how do you coordinate with the with the truck on this? And um, do you do you vent the knee wall itself, or just the uh, the uh, below uh, the above the knee wall? No, uh, we um, we'll, we'll try to actually uh, figure out what's in most jeopardy. And one of the uh, one of the nice things is with knee walls is you can usually identify more push of the smoke as you're coming up. If it's in a uh, one knee wall, and then it's obviously going to get into uh, above the collar ties, what would be considered an attic next. Mm -hmm. But um, you're definitely going to have um, more of a push coming out of the eaves on the knee wall that's involved. Okay. Um, and so that that's one thing is uh, pulling up. We can't just go to the roof, whatever's easiest. We're going to have to pick the right side of the roof. And maybe that uh, is confirmed with what the engine finds when they're opening up walls on the side of the door as they go in. Uh, one thing I want to throw out, too, um, that you made a very good point on is uh, these are usually narrow staircases. Um, so one of the things that we teach in our department is uh, they're about the size of a closet, right? And so usually we talk if I'm going through a small opening, then I'm usually going into a small room. So when guys feel the jam of the door on both sides of their shoulders, they're, they're inclined to believe that they might be going into a closet. So we teach them to poke with the tool first, right? Uh, what can happen is they might poke in there on the floor and hit the first stair with their tool and think that they're actually in a closet or a narrow place. So what we teach now is poke in with the tool. If you hit something low, lift that tool up higher and poke again. And if you're able to poke further, then there's a good chance that that's actually a staircase and not a closet. That's an excellent point. Excellent point. Captain Mike, your experience with uh, with knee walls in finished attics. Yeah, um, yes. Bill, I've had some experience with them in some of the private dwellings. A lot of the areas I worked in didn't have that many buildings with knee walls, but we've I've been in places with them. And a couple of things. Um, one of the things that we talked about is knowing what a knee wall is. If the young men and women on your department don't know what a knee wall is and what the building is, you got to take them out on a drill. You got to get into one of these places and go out there and look about it. If the um, the guys and the girls working on don't know anything about knee wall buildings, find one. Ask the officer to take you out. We've got to be training on these things. We've got to get out and understand what's going on because you could be inside. It's like almost if the, the, the knee wall, as Sam said, it's usually more on one side than the other, usually. But it's like you're going into an oven with the walls around it, you're crawling in there and the fire, the heat element is behind you, okay? Around you and you're crawling into this thing. You've got to understand where you're putting yourself. And the staircases are small and we're gonna have to leave room if somebody has to get out of there. Minimum amount of people we can on those stairways. You're either up or you're down. We don't want people blocking that staircase. Yeah, we don't want yeah. people, you know, I've seen it happen bowling for firefighters, diving down there, yeah. and people trying to get out of there. And it's, you know, everybody's getting knocked down. Everybody's getting injured and everything else. It is a coordinated attack. We have to know what's going on. We have to have the ventilation in, in place. We have to have the line in place. And we got to know where we're going in there. And again, a limited amount of people, we don't want to block ourselves in there. Yeah, we've got a comment here from Jerry Hughes. Uh, can you pop that back up, Peter? So he, he brings up a good point. I think he talked about opening up uh, from the outside. No, he can't. Okay. So I've got it here. I've got it here, Bill. It's from Jerry Hughes, and he says, you got to open up the back of the knee wall, outside wall in a balloon frame building. They often get overlooked. 
Ah, good point. Good point. Uh, I still think that uh, you could throw a ladder up there and take a piercing nozzle and smack it right through the gable then in that where the uh, where the the slope of the roof converges with the with the uh, the uh, the exterior walls. Go ahead, got another Chief one here. <clears throat> Chief Walt wants to say something, Bill. Okay. Yeah, we had a, another good question in here, <clears throat> and we'll get that in a second. But there, I was just going to mention. Uh, Sam raised a great point, and in the um, in the in the modern construction now, where they build the man door at the top of the stairs to enter into the attic, it, it really invites the homeowner to repurpose that attic as a quasi living space or a, a you know a, a media room or many other things. <clears throat> and they're kind of what's interesting about what I've seen on a couple of fires we've had here in these newer homes is the creative stuff they've done uh, because the it's not like a classic attic that, you know, where it's, you know, all there. Right. It's, it's subdivided. There's multiple pitches, you know, it's a, and all that's done for architectural design. But what happens then to Sam's point is a lot of these, a couple of these places that I've seen, they've kept some of it open where they could walk through and, and, and they've, they've kind of repurposed that into a, a smaller attic space, if you will but then they've redesigned the main attic space into a living space. And so you've got kind of, um, for lack of a better word, but um, uh, handyman created knee walls and spaces that, you know, are over soffits and such. So as you open them, there's no, you know, it's not a, it's not a hard, good plywood deck. It could be over a soffit or a porch roof or, you know, all kinds of spaces that were never really intended for, load bearing or or anybody to walk out onto um but now unfortunately when we get up there we do so sam's point was uh well taken when you get when you get into any of these confined spaces that have been re because by definition if they weren't meant for people to live in they're considered a confined space so you get into one of them you, you just got to kind of watch watch yourself so thank you for bringing that up sam and guys and and demographics does affect our job so uh demographic in terms of we have literally millions of people coming into this country where are they going to live and we're already starting to see it uh with the um the fire we saw on the bronx uh that these folks come from a different country they have a much smaller personal space they don't have much money and homes that were originally built for one family are housing numerous families garages there's entire neighborhoods in Miami-Dade County that's at least one residential um, occupancy. And you're going to see just more and more of this. And the younger people in the fire service are going to have to be uh, more vigilant about checking every nook and cranny where people are going to be crammed in, uh, especially homes that were originally built for one family. So Bill, um, here's, your, here's your Facebook question from Lincoln Bureau. It says, yes. gentlemen, have there been any studies of attacking these fires from the exterior walls or the roof? Not an exterior attack, not that an exterior attack would be better, but from a volunteer department with two or three person engine company, that might be the best way to go. Um, actually, uh, Lincoln, if you look up the UL studies, Chief Eric Roden, who is an authority on these fires, actually selected two homes because of the knee wall construction and Chief Roden actually working with UL uh, constructed some knee wall fires <clears throat> that were excellent. Steve, you were there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, um, so that, that would be a good source of some information um, about, about how those uh, particular attacks went. And Steve, you, you were there. You know, the thing is I, with all these fires, again, and Bobby, it was before you jumped on, I believe we talked about it's getting water to the void space. However possible you can do that, you use what you have available to you. If that's a piercing nozzle, introducing that, and Mike, Mike talked about it, that you're going to get some of that steam conversion, and it is in a confined area. So you're going to make a difference with that. Um, I know some of the guys, uh, 30, ladder 32 in our job, they, they have a, their majority of their whole district is apartments. They have a tactic of dropping a piercing nozzle through the roof. And guess what? It's been pretty successful versus trying to get a line to the other end of the hallway because the stair access is better. And they've held fires and stopped burning roofs off 
dropping a piercing nozzle through the attic. Now, is that my first go-to? No, but you just have to, you know, if you put a piercing nozzle piece of ice and turn it on, you're going to see the coverage. And when it's a tight area, it really does hold it well. But steam. going back to, go ahead. When you see steam, then you yeah. know you hit pay dirt. Speaking of the piercing nozzles, Pooter Fire Authority, I believe it's in the Fort Collins, Colorado area, has done a lot of work with uh, small diameter uh, piercing nozzles. And I think that they are, like you say, Steve, you don't need a lot of water. I think that they're using one inch forestry hose, but they're using these things called uh, fog nails, which I guess is a, yeah, a brand name. I don't know. Is, this, but, is that, isn't that the high pressure stuff, Bill? That I don't know, but uh, it just stands to reason that if you have a fire in a concealed space, no matter where you take that piercing nozzle, if you can get the water in that space, and in a sense, not opening it up using the, the, the heat and the confinement holds that steam in, at least initially, and okay, 45 to 90 gallons per minute, but uh I don't know anybody on Pooter's Fire Authority, but I thought that they, uh, they uh, of course, I, I'm a consummate YouTube University uh, firefighting <laughs> video geek like the rest of us. So I've watched it and it looks like a, looks like a, good, a good technique. We've done that before too. Rain roofs. We get rain roofs where for either for aesthetics because it looks prettier to have a higher pitch and then Okay. or um, because they don't want to strip off the uh, original roof. Jimmy, have you seen the pictures that Jenny Davis submitted for the, uh, the hangout today? I have seen it. The last picture was actually, it just happened on, uh, let's see, uh, Saturday, Saturday or Sunday, Sunday, first thing in the morning that, that, uh, Ventilation limited uh, fire as in an attic. That was uh, that was the last photo I think you submitted. We both uh, right. thought. You would you go ahead and be uh, Jimmy's spokesman, and uh, we're going to go ahead and and Peter, we can run those pictures up, and uh, Jimmy will tell you when to run the next one. Okay, here we go. Uh, Jimmy, what's that white stuff on the ground there, man? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I grew up in the Chicago area. I know what that is. Yeah, this was, uh, it looks like we just had, this is after our, I don't know, I think it was maybe 14 inches of snow we received. And it looks like uh, this fire went through the roof and it looks like it burned through. Uh, so, uh, it looks like through the front window there and side A, they burned through the roof. It looks like it's more for the rear. Uh, the concern here for anybody that's on an engine, if you're going to make any fire attack, anybody on the fire ground, fire ground safety, you got to watch that freestanding chimney. Yeah. It was Jimmy was pointing it out too that uh, there's a lot of dangers to uh, new wall fires or fire attack, especially new walls because sometimes the, the chimney is hidden behind a new wall. So they're a danger because they're usually freestanding. So I think Jimmy wanted to maybe make mention of that. And the next photo, please. It was, Ooh, it was, yeah, this was our last work day, so that was uh, Sunday, and uh, so this was first thing in the morning. Uh, obviously, I think there was fire in the and in, uh, in the rear, or and I think it came up front. Obviously, something like this. We were talking about this at the kitchen table this morning. Uh, it's this is a fire you want to start. It, obviously, we're not sending anybody in. Any introduce any introduction of oxygen to this fire, it's going to light up. It's got a good push out of the attic, and you can tell by the smoke conditions, it's gray. So you know it's structure. There's no petroleum involved. And a lot of these knee wall uh, houses, uh, at least in the Chicago area, uh, a good amount of them, there's not a lot of petroleum-based products. So if you get some good uh, gray smoke, you can pretty much think that there's some structure involved. And to something like this, we're going to start going from an exterior attack. I don't, I, I'm pretty confident that no battalion chief's going to have any companies start making uh, an attack, an aggressive attack in the, in the interior. 
we would start opening up some, uh, some obviously, this thing the smells coming out of the wall in the attic, so we would definitely try and get a line up there, maybe put some water in there. I don't know exactly what the rear, because this is only one side of the row, but the truck companies put ground ladders to their, uh, to the roof. It looks like they're, I said roof, yes. Uh, it looks like they put ground ladders to side, the delta side, so uh, they were trying to make a, a ventilation before this thing really grew some legs. Uh, and then Jimmy, just, this house here, I'm looking at a rear stairway. Now, is this the kind of house that was originally a single family? And then now it's double family, put the stairway. I wouldn't be surprised if that was a, a multiple family. To my to my uh, to my thoughts to this would be checking the basement or checking the bottom the first floor or the garden. How oh, there's different vernacular that different departments use for that that base. Uh, the thing that would concern me is uh, getting anybody near there. If you were going to, again, this is a fire. I don't, I, I, this is going to light up pretty soon. So uh, for me, the, the hose lines in place, getting the cameras, this is, it looks like it's a, it's a balloon frame uh, from the way it looks from the outside. I don't, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's, it's not, it's not a platform frame. Yeah. And yeah. to interior stairwell, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was an interior stairwell, uh, to get into that first floor from the side, and that that's what will concern me. But if I saw that much smoke coming out of the uh, out of the attic, I see it on the first floor. I don't see a lot of it in the front or on the basement or the garden or the um, ground floor. But again, I don't know what's presenting on the on the uh, the Charlie side. But these are concerns that uh, Sam Hiddle said about being coordinated fire attack. Obviously, you want to. We, we are a very aggressive vertical ventilation department and we do a lot of roof company operations and definitely I'm sure that they pulled the guys off the roof uh, for this building, uh, for this fire. And I think there was another uh, building involved with this well, an exposure building, but I, I don't remember seeing any photos posted for this. I want to throw this out too. Um, this is exactly what we we're talking about where you can look at, you can tell which uh, knee wall is affected more than the other. Um, so they did a great job with their ladder placement on that. But it also shows that if it's in the knee walls, it's definitely going to go up to the attic. And if we can stop it there, then we can maybe prevent it from going through the other knee wall. Um, and if it started, it got up into the attic first, it will drop down into the knee walls as well. So, Sam, to your point, I just want to honor that, not with an argument, but more of just, just for what we see from construction here. Uh, we, to me, and then my experiences fighting are uh, going to uh, see knee wall uh, fires in knee walls. The way that they they're finished with drywall, it it goes from looking at this. Here you said about the knee walls fire cutting the fire off and spreading from the other side. And my experiences it, it's kind of like a horseshoe. They they just put drywall up the rafters and then they just put that the middle piece in just to make it look aesthetically. But then they 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 cut out they drywall the other side. So if they drywall the Bravo side, you're definitely a drywall on the Delta side. And my experiences, you either it doesn't matter what side, I mean, it matters what side of the fire is on, but you're going to have smoke and smoke and fire travel kind of traveling like a horseshoe. It's just going to go. There's really no stop in there, at least in my experiences that I've seen in the construction in Chicago. So that to me is a concern. So even like you're saying, making an aggressive attack, you how you said of your truck companies going to the top of the stairs. Before I would send anybody into the into the attic uh, to fight these knee wall fires, that would definitely stop. Like you said, if they're that framed out door frame, I would have the trucks just do an inspection hold their Halligans east side. I think Steve Robertson even alluded to a little bit of this attack. Uh, and if you see smoke coming in there or smoke billowing out of those inspection holes before you commit into the attic to those knee wall fires, put the line in there and hit it with a straight stream or a smooth board, whatever your department uses, and definitely give it a whack because – uh, some of these, some of these buildings, uh, uh, like Chief Holton said, that the knee wall goes front to back. But uh, some of the structures, a good amount of structures in Chicago, not both sides do that. Sometimes they're 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 kind of segmented by either interior stairwell coming up in the middle, or there's a a, a smaller uh, segment which is like where a bathroom maybe uh, formed out or, or framed out in that attic. So to me, my concern is uh, smoke and fire both sides, Sam. Because uh, if you get some kind of uh, extinguishing agent there, like Steve said, you're gonna get, you're gonna make a difference, and you're gonna change it, and then you can get your companies to to full, make a coordinated attack aggressively in, into the attic and to open up the knee walls, and you have protection with that line there. I okay. I, I want to add to that, Jimmy, because I think one thing that we're all saying is we got to slow down on this. I mean, we we've got to slow down, and, and 
I call it, I use the analogy, the speed of the game. And what I mean by that is when's the last Heisman Trophy winner who went to the NFL and succeeded their first year? Doesn't happen often. Second year, doesn't happen. Third year, you start to hear their name. All of a sudden, this guy is a super. The media all ask the same question. What changed? They all have the exact same answer. The game slowed down for me. I'm seeing the field better. I'm seeing everything better. Company officers in the right front seat is no different. As you gain that experience, the game slows down. Picking up the little benchmarks of it pushing out right farther. Color of the smoke billowing out of the ease. I think we get ourselves in trouble a lot of times because we don't recognize that it is a knee wall fire to start with. We're thinking it's just in the attic. You're going up there doing your thing and you end up getting jammed up because of it. But the, the keys that I want is, is, is the eaves are huge and the color of the smoke is huge. Absolutely two huge indicators to me that we've got a good knee wall fire. Okay. Jimmy, you want to go to the next picture? Yes, sir. There you go. There you go. This is the basic construction and maybe just the description of what Sam was saying. But uh, and it, the, adding to this photo, the thought, at least of my experience, is that and that fire will come from the left. I'm looking at the screen from my left. And it actually would just kind of travel onto the other side. And that's and then extend that way. So that that's where we've really ran, got jammed up. Uh, and getting people searching ahead of the line. Like Steve said, we got to slow down. To me, these dangers of the smoke travel from one side to the other and the fire following smoke from one side to the other is going to cause that attic to light up. And you may not see the fire, it's a hidden fire, but you're sure going to feel a lot of that heat and it's going to put you to your belly. So to me, like we were talking about, like Steve said, early detection, uh, inspection holes, taking a look to see if, we're at new, if there's fire in the new walls into the main street um, is huge. And uh, I know that uh, Sam was talking about the collar ties. Absolutely. And that's where they just, sometimes they just drywall right above it. So to me, it's just kind of one goes from one side to the other side and back down uh, like a horseshoe. And and again, that that's uh, it's huge for me. And, and sometimes uh, if, if guys are having a hard time getting into the attic or checking the knee walls from, uh, from getting up the stairs, going, like I was mentioning earlier, going on their first floor, maybe going to the exterior sidewalls. But like Chief, you said, uh, Chief Gustin, it, that uh, you were sometimes running the floorboards. So the other option is maybe going to a bathroom on the first floor and trying to pull ceiling above. Maybe there's no floorboards uh, towards the exterior wall. Sometimes there are because it's a floor, but uh, it's just a, it's 50-50. And then uh, I know for uh, at least on our, on our job, uh, the squads have a uh, battery operated uh, chainsaws. So we can actually make attempts to open up from below, get to get in those knee walls to make an early hit to give more of a chance for companies to get in, to check knee walls and protect them getting in for the active searches for uh, fire and victim on the, in that attic. That's a, that's a great picture. Yes, it is. And Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Sunig, um, you keep talking about the horseshoe. So what you're, what you're, what you're relating is it's it's interconnected. Then the the, the both the knee walls and above the collar tie are interconnected. Yeah, they're they're, they're if you like Chief Halden said, there's all these remodels. So this this was built to be an attic, but if you want to make it a livable space, a livable living space, you put the drywall, you frame it up, and you put the drywall on. Well, behind the drywall, there's no fire stops. So from one uh, one side where, like it says, concealed fire uh, on the left-hand side, it travels up like you see in this diagram. Yeah, but the then that, yeah. it's smoking, so it just starts banking down the other side of that rafter and down into that little small uh, concealed fire space that says concealed space fire. So that's what I mean by horseshoe. So it just goes like it comes up to the top, to the, to the ridge line, but then it goes back down because all they did was drywall. If there's no fire stoppage, uh, it's like per building code-wise that prevents that fire or that smoke to come down the other side. So if we're looking at the, this diagram where the flame is in the, on, the, on the underneath the sheeting material and the rafters, we'll call that side B, Bravo side. It will actually build down to the Delta side, which is the other exterior wall to your right. It'll just smoke down there. And that's, again, what we worry about our combustible, uh, you know, the pro unburned products of combustion, our biggest gas is carbon monoxide. So when all that smoke billows down to the other side, then that fire is just going to 
travel or follow that smoke. And then and that's where it's going to get a flammable range. And uh, for carbon monoxide, one of the products, of, one of the uh, byproducts of combustion, the gas. And then that's where when you get that, that fire will light up. And then anybody in the attic, if you don't make inspection holes or do like an early detection to see if it's in the walls, that's where we're going to get caught. So that's mm-hmm. where I came in by a horseshoe. There's no fire stoppage going up the rafters and across the ridge, the ridge line versus rafter and collar tie. It just banks right back down to the other side. And I'm and sorry. You, what, we, what, what we oh, saw, yeah. what we saw a couple of months ago, you, you, where you see where the roof lines come in, it, it, it goes out a little further and the soffits here, our soffits come out a good, oh, maybe a foot, uh, sometimes a little shy, but usually it's at least a foot, right? So you got your roof line coming over and then there are vents, they're all vented. So what we had was a pretty good fire where the guy had created a, you know, living space for his kids, playroom area, and the kids are playing with matches, screwing around back in there. And the, it, on one side, smoke was pushing down like you see in the photo. And the other side, what, that was the draw. It was, like a, it was like a Franklin stove inside this makeshift knee wall. And it was r- really interesting fire because it, 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 got, it got off to the races fast. And once it got above, he had created a, like a, a drop ceiling, like where it says interior finish, he'd put a, he'd decided to put a ceiling. But then there was all kinds of just debris and whatnot and such, and so it was a, it was a it was a it was a really sporty job, and the whole roof burned off the house. But um, but that was like so like that part of it. What was fortunate with this guy, he had a he had a back porch, and and that space up there was kind of open. But in talking with the guy, he said, "Yeah, I was thinking of." Put, add on at that point too to make make another like little storage area up there and i'm like holy crap you so so to to sam's point and your point you just don't know what you're getting into uh with with these remodels and to bill's point um folks are trying to maximize living space for all kinds of reasons you know more and more kids are living at home more and more you know moms and dads are you know sharing living space these days as we you know just you know the just because of the economy and the way things are going. And uh, so it's not going to be, I think it's going to be more usual to see, you know, these spaces repurposed for all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, home businesses, you know, weed is us and stuff like that, you know, meth way, you know, they're going to be, they use those spaces as well. So you don't know what you're going to find up there. You can have a grow lab up there. You can have all kinds of stuff. So. And very honestly, Bobby, they dropped that ceiling up there as you were both talking about, you and Jim were talking about, Steve, they dropped the ceiling to give the illusion of more room. Even though the ceiling's lower, it's wider. So it gives that illusion of more room and they create another space above those collar ties as you were talking about the horseshoe. And that's the, and the thing is, when you're going in there, you have to be very, very careful because you don't know whether a professional put this up there or not, or Joe homeowner, who's just, you know, like uh, doesn't know what he's doing and there's no bracing, there's no cross ties, there's no nothing up there to tie this all together. And if that whole ceiling comes down on you at one time, you are in a huge problem. Ours was a Joe homeowner and it it was great because you know how you have your, usually have your studs, you know, 16. He went four foot and eight foot. He just barely had the drywall. It was pretty good. It looked good, but it didn't hold up well. Oh, he was a good spackler, not a good framer. He was excellent. He was an excellent drywall taper and spackler. Hey, and I, I just wanted to get Bill to give a shout out to our sponsor. Yes. Well, uh, I am a big fan of Kehoe's because I use it uh, here at the training academy. And that's what my department uses. Uh, there's various grades and, and designs. I want to talk about the uh, combat sniper. Uh, there's a lot of departments that are uh, leaning towards the, their happy place is around 160 gallons a minute. So that this is a uh, smaller diameter version of the combat ready, which is if it's inch and three quarters, which is actually like 1.88. Well, this is a smaller diameter than the uh, combat ready and it's designed for again a, a flow of about 160 gallons a minute so uh the it has the same 
maneuverability and kink resistance, but it's a little bit lighter and, and easier to handle. So uh, if you're looking for buying new hose, first of all, don't ever go cheap on hose. It's your lifeline. And secondly, um, look at key. Every one of the grades that they have are, are excellent. And uh, most of it is made in, in LA, made right in LA, right? Lower Alabama, Dothan, Alabama. The boss and I have been there. So uh, big shout out to Key. Did you want to go through some more pictures there, uh, Jimmy? So I think Mal Dothan, Alabama is the home of Fire Chief Larry Williams. And if you're ever in town, the, the Dotham guys will give you a, a great tour and take you to the Key Hose plant where they've got fast friends. They also have a nuclear facility down there, and they'll be happy to show you that. It's fascinating to see the brigade stuff that they have there. Jim, you would love to see it, uh, some of the pre-pipe stuff that they have. I mean, it really, really kind of an impressive, it's an impressive site to go to. Now see here, and again, kudos to Jimmy Davis, who's probably freezing his ass off right now, uh, performing the overhaul on that fire. And, uh, I think it's before you got on. Did you know, Bobby, that Jimmy's operating at a uh, uh, a working fire, and uh, they had like five or seven lines out. So, uh, and they I guess they've got it struck out, which means it's they don't expect any further progress. But look at here, you notice. I mean, he's reading our mind. Notice the floor decking not extending to the roof line. Okay. That is a very uh, important size up consideration. And also I can see there, uh, Jimmy, that uh, what you talk about with the horseshoe, where those, those spaces are, in this case, inter interconnected. Is there anything I missed, Jimmy? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. And, and just, uh, it's one of these things where even the, the question earlier about, you know, with the department with three people, you're going to have to do some inspection to find out where the fire's been and where it's at and where it's going. Uh, if you can, if you can make an attempt from below with minimum manning to even pull some, if you have floorboards or not, you know, if you have a, an attic fire, maybe making a, a quick, a, a quick hit there before you make an attempt to go into the attic uh, or even like you were, uh, you and chief Halton about uh, soft. Uh, even Steve, I'm sure Steve sees it and Sam as well. The thing with the, peak roofs that the soffits are great, but different construction and in, um, construction specific. Um, some homes that were like uh, some of those architectural homes that are showcased or, or uh, landmark status or people who really want to make their house stand up, they may not have aluminum soffits on the side to pull easily. Uh, I, I, uh, I heard Chief Roden say that and I actually had, I was at a fire and I tried doing that and I encountered uh, Tongue of Groove Douglas Fir. Needless to say, when I put my pipe pole up there, man, my shoulders were red, and I, I had a, <laughs> I went inside for a different approach. So I think to that gentleman's question earlier, it depends on the construction. And this is just an example to show that sometimes people don't extend those floorboards where you can go underneath on their first floor and make an attempt to open up a knee wall if there's challenges making progress to go into the attic or into that half story space uh, before you commit for a fire attack or for search. Jimmy, we have wire lath with about an inch of heavy stucco plaster. So once you do penetrate it and you manage to penetrate it and then you yank on it, you know, it's a substantial, but it's only held up by furring strips. And this thing will come down like a roll of dominoes, actually, you know, break your neck. But um, I'm glad you brought this up because this is going to be a topic and we're going to, this is going to have to extend next month. This is for everybody. Okay. Operating the stream up into the soffits does not work for us. I've talked to other departments in the state of Florida where it works very good for them. It doesn't with us, but that doesn't mean that it's not a valid um, uh, tactic. And I'm, I'm going to ask everybody here, um, what is your experience with it? I mean, it's one of the uh, findings from the UL study was operating the stream up uh, through the uh, soffits. 
But there again, those soffits were pretty easy to tear down. Like they were either vinyl or very uh, small gauge sheet metal. In your case, Jimmy, it's tongue and groove pine. It's not going to be easy to bring it down. My experience is there haven't been aggressive attempts to uh, hit it from the soffit side. Only unless the only other, uh, unless we're defensive and are trying to make some kind of a, a push to see if they can get it. But that's just going to be, uh, I think it's really back to what everyone said earlier about knowing your building construction. When you do your 360, you got to take a look and see what you have. Uh, I mean, because you, you have to have options. You know, you just can't say, well, we're stuck. You got to have, well, there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way. There's got to be a way. So if one way doesn't work, you got to find a different way. That's just part of our culture of our job. Oh, Jimmy, one of the biggest mistakes that a fire officer makes, and a lot of it has to do with ego. We don't want to fail. And when we become involved in a task, we become emotionally involved in terms of our ego. We don't, we want to see it succeed. And what happens, and it's human nature for all of us, we tend to do the wrong thing for too long without changing the game plan. I got to share this video, the next hangout. This young man sent me a video uh, of a, a pushing, pushing fire in hoarder conditions. And they took that line in the front door and they met a wall of uh, boiling smoke, high heat, no visible flame. They withdrew that line and took it around and attacked the fire through the back Charlie's side kitchen door and put a good stop on that thing. And this is a young, sharp guy. And I said, well, God bless you, man. You realize you were, it was not working. And you said, stop, we're going to try something else. The tendency is for us to do the wrong thing for too long. Um, Anybody else want to weigh in on this attacking the fire from uh, from the soffits as has been uh, uh, detailed in the UL attic studies? Well, for I'll me, this, most. Um, go ahead, Sam. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, on some of uh, mostly on the older construction, we expect to uh, see what we call bird walking, where you're going to have a two by four where the uh, roof truss meets the uh, wall. Um, and that's just so when uh, birds dig in through vents or they um, get in there, they beat the soffit. Uh, they don't actually get up into your attic space. Um, but for us personally, which is something else uh, we haven't really discussed, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on um, getting water to the fire and steam conversion and all that. We've still, even with steam conversion, we've still got to get that heat out because we've got to get up there and get that search. Um, and, and that's that's incredibly important and has to be considered in whatever tactics you're choosing. Uh, for Wichita personally, um, we put the lines inside. We're going to uh, go up top and try to open it up. And we're gonna put the lines inside. Uh, that way we're covering the paths of egress, picking up people that might be um, trying to get out and we can get up there. We're already in a position to do a search as soon as we get a knock and things are tenable enough to do that. Uh, Sam, take a look at that insulation. My best guess, I got a guess. What do you think that insulation is? It looks old. Looks like old old man. cellulite. Yeah. There you go. Those. Mike, Captain Mike, it is cellulose insulation. It is nothing more than ground up newspaper. And gentlemen, the buzzwords of today, green and sustainable, are not the fireman's friend, especially when it comes to things like ground up cellulose insulation. And Bill? In yes, there, we have electric, and I don't know, but I can't tell you the number of fires I've had with that insulation, and it's a topic for another day, where they've blown it in around the uh, uh, light, the electrical boxes and the light fixtures. Bingo. And um, fires, I mean, multiple alarms, third alarms, fourth alarm fires, all, especially a lot of times, you know, because it's blown in, it happens on the top floor ceiling. And uh, so it's something we maybe want to talk about in another ha hangout. Yeah. Uh, fellas, we, uh, we've come to our time. We're definitely going to carry on for another month because I want uh, Jimmy Davis to come back. 
uh, some of our other guys. Uh, Daryl wasn't able to participate today, Daryl Liggins. Fellas, I'm going to send you that video of the, this young cup, the company officer uh, attacking the fire through the front door, and then he pulls his people out, repositions this line because he had a plan B in his back pocket. So um, uh, my hat's off to Jimmy Davis. Uh, we want to have him have his say, and let's pick this up. I might not be here next month. I've got uh, officer development for the new lieutenants. And to me, that is like my most important job on my, on my fire department is uh, the two days, full days I get with the, new, the newly promoted lieutenants. So, but that doesn't mean you guys can't carry on this conversation uh, next, next month. And uh, I want to thank again, our, our, our good friends at Key, that's keyhose.com. And I want to thank our special guest, uh, Jimmy Sunig and uh, Steve Robertson, um, who really brought a lot to the table here. So uh, any final words before we say goodbye to our viewers? I'd just like to remind everybody to sign up for FDIC. Hot classes are filling up fast. So if you want to do hands-on training with Steve, get, get in there now because uh, he'll be teaching for us the uh, Writ under fire class at the uh, University of Illinois is really filling up fast. That's going to, that one is going to sell out quick because that's a really incredible eight hour day where they take that, they put together just the most amazing class you could imagine for us. So please uh, make sure you make sure you sign up early and uh, get to hear Bill Gustin and Mike Dugan and Sammy and everybody, Steve and everybody do their thing. Jimmy, it's going to be a great time. It's a, it's going to be, you know, it, 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 we are going to be post COVID. I can say with almost uh, complete assurity after having listened to Dr. Fauci today saying it's uh, pretty much time to end it all. So it, uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to uh, ha hang out maskless and uh, do our thing and, and it'll, it'll, be, uh, it'll be wonderful. So please sign up early and, and, and get in there and uh, sure looking forward to seeing everybody um, and, and uh, thank you all for your support and all that good stuff. Thank you, Bill and Mike for Hosting this uh, hangout, it's uh, wonderful. Looks a bit, you know, you got to run, Steve. Take it yeah. off. All right, yes, brother. Sir. God All right, bless. Thanks, man. guys. All, All right, right Steve. Be safe. All guys. right. God bless. Jimmy Sunig. Thank you, gentlemen, for allowing uh, me part of your uh, group today. Uh, uh, oh, thank you, man. All right, your brother Jimmy, take take care, man. Thank and you, Jim. And uh, Sam. Where's yeah. Sam? Yeah. Sam, right had right here. Sam had a Sam had Oh, I don't see him. He's there. He's okay. there, Billy. Any final thoughts? Any closing uh, words? No, nah, like okay. I said, to me, just make sure that um, you're considering search um, along with that suppression. Um, we're suppressing so we can make that tenable to get our people in there, make it uh, more survivable for them. Um, that's what's going to be important. Um, one other thing, um, just a nugget, you know, that we found useful is um, sometimes it can be difficult to find those stairs, uh, particularly if they've been remodeled. Uh, generally, if you can find one set of stairs, then you go to the opposite side and the header is your riser. Um, so if the stairs are going down this way, then typically the stairs are going up on the other side. All right, so Sam. a lot of times we'll find the stairs on a floor with good visibility, and then we know where to find the uh, stairs going up. All right, everybody. I think we've, uh, we've just scratched the surface of this. And uh, I, like I say, I might not be with you next month because I've got the new lieutenants, but uh, uh, you'll, you'll, you, you will somehow manage without me, I, I have a feeling. Uh, but anyway, fellas, uh, until next month, and to our viewers, uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and God bless. <laughs>